Okay, so I think uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I wanted to thank you, thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I realize there's a lot going on and we really appreciate you spending an hour with us at DREDEF. Um, my name is Sydney Pickern and I'm a staff attorney at DREDEF. I, I work on um, housing and emergency planning issues and I will also be presenting with Sylvia Yi, who's a colleague and a friend and um, one of our lead healthcare attorneys at DREDEF. So DREDEF, um, many of you are familiar, uh, the acronym is Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. We are a national law and policy center by and for people with disabilities. We advocate uh, on all types of disability rights issues, including special education, healthcare, and housing. And we are also a support center in California. So we provide technical assistance and training to um, frontline legal service providers. Um, and the presentation today is California LTSS 101, Long-Term Services and Supports 101 with COVID-19 considerations. Um, just a couple quick notes before we begin. I've placed the real-time captioning um, link in the chat. Um, so it's there at the very beginning. And um, if you could please put any questions you have in the chat, we will have a time for answering questions at the end. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say was that the, the video will be posted on DREDF's web, website. And I will also make the PowerPoint and the video available to people who have registered. Um, and there will be um, some resources in the notes of the PowerPoint that um, will, should be useful to folks. So why does this presentation matter? So we know that housing security is vital for the health and well-being um, and community integration for everyone. I'm just going to quickly turn off uh, my video so that um, to make sure that the interpreters are centered. We also know that people with disabilities with multiple marginalized identities and households with disabled members who need long term services services and supports or LTSS are also hugely affected by housing insecurity. As many of you know, when we're talking about housing insecurity, we're really talking about people with disabilities um, being rent burdened, meaning that, meaning that the majority of their income goes towards covering their rent. We're also talking about housing conditions so LTSS households are three times as likely to face inadequate housing conditions as households without disabled members. So this really means housing units may have leaky roofs, mold, walls with cracks and holes, fault electrical wiring or plumbing, broken refrigerators, things like this. Um, and housing insecurity also includes susceptibility to natural disasters, which is really poignant right now. In fact, uh, LTSS households are almost twice as likely to live in neighborhoods with a higher susceptibility to natural dis disasters than non-disabled households. And of course, this unfortunately includes wildfires, floods, hurricanes, and tornadoes. So all these factors contribute, contribute to placing the LTSS household at a greater risk of losing their home. And, and so it's important for us to be aware that often the people that rely on our frontline legal service providers and our independent living advocates are people who either utilize or people who would benefit from long-term services and supports, which is what we're here to talk about. So what is it? I'm generally 
long-term services and supports are a broad range of health and social services that provide varying levels of assistance for children, adults, and older adults with disabilities to help them perform routine daily activities. People who utilize LTSS have all kinds of disabilities, including cognitive disabilities like or Down syndrome, physical disabilities, including multiple sclerosis or spinal cord injuries, sensory disabilities like blindness or deafness, and mental health disabilities like depression or post-traumatic stress disorder, and chronic conditions like um, cancer or HIV, AIDS. And LTSS can be provided in institutional and home and community-based settings. Institutional settings include nursing facilities and intermediate care facilities. And home and community settings include, of course, individuals' homes, but also community centers and assisted living facilities. So it's, it's important to note um, that when LTSS is provided in home and community settings, it is known as Home and Community Based Services, or HCBS. And this is really what this presentation is focused on. So what does HCBS include? It provides assistance with activities of daily living, also referred to as self-care tasks, like eating, bathing, and dressing, and then instrumental activities of daily living, sometimes referred to as household activities, such as preparing meals, managing medication, and housekeeping. And then HCBS includes a range of benefits, such as residential services, adult day healthcare programs, home health aid services, personal care services, and case management, among many others. And although there has historically been an institutional bias towards institutional placement, in recent years, states have begun to utilize HCBS more readily. And this is really owed to the utilizers of HCBS and healthcare and disability rights advocates who have really strived over the decades to advocate for services and supports to be a available in the community to help people with disabilities maintain their independence, which, as many of you know, is a hallmark of the disability rights advocacy um, and the ind independent living movement. And another reason for this shift towards HCBS was the Supreme Court Olmstead decision in 1999, which I'll include a site in the notes. Um, and the Olmstead decision found that the unjustified institutionalization of persons with disabilities violates uh, the, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, and it was really a major driving force for this shift. So at the bottom of this slide, slide I have an asterisk um, that says home care provider inequities. And this is also something that I thought uh, was important to highlight, and I, I'm going to do it briefly. Um, despite the challenging nature of the work and the significant contribution home care workers make to improve the quality of life of the people they assist, job quality for this workforce is often um, very low. Um, home care has historically not been valued or respected as quote unquote real work, um, both because of the traditional view that care work is a private activity outside of the economy, and also because of the devaluation of women, and especially women of color, who have historically done the majority of this work. Um, just for some context, in 2015, the median hourly wage of home care work, workers in California was $10.05. Um, many home care workers are also the primary earners in their households, 
and often their earnings from home care are the main source of income for their family. Um, and so one of the solutions to this multifaceted issue is not only raising awareness around the issue when we have the opportunity, but also to advocate for a fairly compensated, direct support professional workforce. And so California, so the next slide is California's major HCBS programs. And this is really a high level look at some of the key HCBS programs available in California. Uh, it's important to understand that these are Medi-Cal pro programs, so applicants need to be Medi-Cal eligible. Medi-Cal is, a, of course, California's version of Medicaid, which is a federal and state health insurance program that helps with medical costs for people with limited income and resources. Medi-Cal is the primary payer uh, for institutional and community-based LTSS in California. Um, there, there is limited coverage under Medicare for LTSS, for example, um, short-term services in institutional settings, and there are few affordable options in the private insurance market, but I, it's important to note that Medi-Cal is the largest public payer for both LTSS and HCBS. Um, so in California, there are a number of different HCBS programs that can help individuals with disabilities and older adults remain in their home or help them return home from a long-term care facility. And the federal Medicaid statute and other provisions in the Social Security Act offer California broad statutory authorities under which HCBS can be offered to Medi-Cal beneficiaries. And um, like, like the slide indicates, these authorities include both the Medicaid state plan and uh, HCBS waivers. And so state plan benefits, the Medicaid state plan refers to the part of the Medicaid program that generally follows certain program benefit rules outlined in the Medicaid statute. These rules require states to cover selected benefits under the traditional Medicaid state plan and give states the option to cover others. And so the state plan benefits listed here are certainly not an exhaustive list. They're, excuse me, they're just some of the ones that are helpful for this population. So it's important to note here that state plan benefits are an entitlement meaning if one meets the eligibility requirements, services must be received. And so uh, the home health state plan services are the only HCBS that are required for states participating in Medicaid. Um, Medi-Cal generally covers home health services for people with disabilities and older adults over the age of 21 who need medical services at home. Home health must be medically necessary and ordered by a physician as part of a written plan of care that a physician reviews every 60 days. And then covered services include skilled nursing, physical speech and occupational therapy, uh, medical supplies, equipment, home health, and um, appliances for use in the home and then services are often provided in a participant's re residence. And then the next item on the slide, in-home supportive services. Many of you are going to be familiar with this, but this program, but um, so this is Medi-Cal's version of the Medicaid personal care benefit. In-home supportive services or IHSS is the largest of California's HCBS programs and can be used in conjunction with other HCBS services. Again, IHSS is also an entitlement, meaning, meaning if one meets the eligibility requirements, services will be re received. So IHSS services include house cleaning, meal preparation, laundry, a grocery shopping, personal care, 
um, accompanying accompaniment to medical appointments, paramedical services like injections, administering medications and wound care, and protective supervision. Protective supervision is a service that people with certain disabilities can qualify for, where an individual can receive up to 24 hours of supervision if they aren't safe alone. And I mentioned this one because this is one of the in-home services that county agencies often tend to try to arbitrarily reduce. Uh, so it's, it's definitely a good one to be aware of. Uh, What's unique about IHSS in particular is that it is a self-directed or consumer-directed a program, which means that the care recipient is the boss and can hire, supervise, and terminate his or her caregiver's employment. Only a minority of Medicaid or Medi-Cal consumer assistance programs follow this model even though this is even though this concept is also a huge part of the independent living movement ethos in ihss personal care providers can also include spouses parents of minor children as well as other relatives and ihss is administered by county based public entities called ihss public authorities and this is in cooperation with the California Department of Social Services. It is, IHSS is available to all ages and population groups who meet the needs criteria established by the state. And then I, uh, HCBS waivers. So quickly, HCBS waivers are programs that provide additional medical and social services to specific groups of individuals. They limit services to specific geographic areas and they provide medical coverage to individuals who may not otherwise be eligible under traditional Medi-Cal rules. And we're gonna go into some of the details of some of the waiver programs in the next slides, um, but just big picture, Waivers are also useful because they often allow participants to have higher income eligibility limits than regular state plan Medi-Cal. However, they also require the participant to meet a certain level of care to utilize the waivers. And regular Medi-Cal can be less restrictive with the care requirements of program participants. So level of care, uh, I've included some, I'll, I'll include some citations in the notes uh, to the California regs that provide more information on what these mean, but because the waivers are meant to be an alternative to institutionalization, the level of care requirements are used as a way to prioritize people who may otherwise be institutionalized to receive care in the community. And then uh, under HCBS waivers, oh, I wanted to just talk about waitlist for a second. Um, again, Medi-Cal beneficiaries, they're not legally entitled to waiver services, even if they meet the financial, functional, and medical criteria. Um, because the demand for waiver services is often greater than the number of people who can be served, California has established a, a waiting list for waiver service. Um, there are, of course, real consequences associated with the shortage of waiver services, including unnecessary, unwanted, and costly institutional care, as well as family members being forced to quit jobs or take on second jobs to help care for their loved ones. Um, so that's just a, a real world implication of wait lists. And then the next slide is California HCBS waivers. Again, this is also not an exhaustive list, but these are the five, uh, these are the five key HCBS waivers currently available in California, and they are the Assisted Living Waiver, or ALW, the Home and Community-Based Alternatives Waiver, 
referred to as the HCBA, the Home and Community-Based Services Waiver for the Developmentally Disabled, which is referred to as HCBS-DD, the Multiple Purpose Senior Services Waiver, which is referred to as MSSP, and then the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome or AIDS Waiver. Again, it's important to note that there are restrictions on eligibility for HCBS waiver programs, including based on medical condition and geography. And it's also important to note that individuals cannot be enrolled in more than one waiver. So we won't be going into all of these, but for the ones that we won't be discussing today, we'll include in notes the eligibility requirements and the application process and links to the lead agencies as well as some additional resources. So the next slide, so going into the assisted living waiver. Uh, the assisted living waiver is unique in that to receive services, you must be willing to live in a participating assisted living facility or participating publicly subsidized housing. And particularly for the subsidized housing option, there are a very limited number of participating subsidized housing units. And I'll include a link in the notes so that you, you can see where these units are available. When I first looked at this, I thought, hey, this is great. There's going to be an abundance of publicly subsidized housing units that participate in the program. But when I refer to the list, I, I saw that the number of units was quite small. So it's important to double check that if this is something that you might be working with someone on. Um, so let's go through the eligibility requirements. Um, a person must be age 21 or older. Um, a person needs to have full scope Medi-Cal eligibility with zero share of cost, and then qualify for a nursing facility level of care. And then this is what we were talking about before, willing to live in an assisted living facility or publicly subsidized housing as an alternative to a nursing facility, facility, able to reside safely in an assisted living facility, and then willing to live in an assisted living facility or publicly subsidized housing located in one of the counties providing ALW services. So the ALW pays for assisted living, care coordination, and other uh, benefits and is currently available in 15 California counties. Again, it should be emphasized that program participants are not required to currently reside in these counties, only to move to an assisted living residence that is located within one of these counties. So once enrolled in Medi-Cal, the next step is to request the assisted living waiver by contacting one of the care coordinating agencies in your county. And the goal of the assisted living waiver is really to facilitate a safe and timely transition of people with disabilities from a nursing facility to a community home-like setting, or in the alternative, offer older adults and people with disabilities who already reside in the community but are at risk of institutionalization, the option of utilizing the waiver to either move to or continue to reside in an ALF or public su subsidized housing. Okay, so moving on to home and community-based alternatives waiver. So the eligibility for, for this waiver is um, one can be any age. They have to be medical eligible, of course, and then meet the nursing facility level of care. Uh, one needs to be either living in a hospital or nurse, nursing facility already or be at risk of institutionalization within 30 days. 
And then uh, the other requirement is to be able to safely and sustainably receive required care in the home. And then I've, I've included um, how to go about applying for uh, this waiver is to contact the waiver agency in your county, which I will include information on in the notes. So the home and community-based alternatives waiver provides a wide range of services to people living in or at risk for nursing facility placement. Services include private duty nursing, uh, waiver personal care services, case management and coordination, environmental accessibility adaptations, and many more. The waiver personal care services uh, in this waiver may be used to increase the amount of in-home care beyond what is allocated through IHSS. And unlike some of the other waivers, the HCBA waiver is available statewide. There is a waiting list for most participants, but applicants who are currently residing in a residential care facility are prioritized for funding. So that's important to note. And then moving on to the Multipurpose Senior Services Waiver or MSSP. So the eligibility requirements for this are to be 65 and older, Medi-Cal eligible, qualify for a nursing facility level of care, live in or live in or willing to move to one of the 46 counties where the waiver is available. And then I've included, I've included information on where to learn more about the waiver and the application process, which is by contacting um, your local area agency on aging. And I've also included a number on the slide, um, which is 1-800-510-2020. So MSSP services include case management and personal care, transportation, meal services, money management, housing assistance and home repair, and many others. Enrollment in this waiver is capped at 12,000 participants. And again, it's not available in every county. There are nearly 40 community health nonprofit organizations that administer MSSP at the local level. And once an older adult is Medi-Cal enrolled, they can be referred to their local community service provider. Um, and then as the slide re reiterates, to find a county-specific MSSP provider, one can contact their local area agency on aging office. Okay, so we've made it through the, the more technical part of the presentation and then I wanted to um, just briefly give some real world examples of home and community based services. So um, the first, just reading off the slide, um, the first example is an older adult with dementia who was able to move from a facility to an apartment with home health services and medical supplies. The next example is a person with cerebral palsy uh, valued the increased independence that they experienced when they um, received assistance with uh, going grocery shopping and with errands. Uh, the next example is a young adult with developmental disabilities is able to improve his independent living skills and participate in the community with the support of a Medi-Cal attendant. And then the last example on the slide is a person with multiple sclerosis uh, hopes to receive a car attachment to transport his power wheelchair as uh, HCBS waiver service. And then another example that I want to mention here, and it's not on the slide, but um, would also be highly relevant to advocates, is where a person experiencing homelessness um, who has disabilities uh, can receive IHSS in-home supportive services in the shelter where they're staying to assist with self-care activities of daily living and retrieving meals, for example. We've, at DREDF, we've definitely seen some pushback from shelters and other temporary housing providers on this, and I 
we definitely would like to know if you're seeing this as well, um, particularly in the context of Project Room Key, uh, which many of you know is the locally administered state program that is meant to fund hotels and motels for COVID positive and COVID vulnerable people experiencing homelessness. So that, that was another example that I thought it was important to highlight. And then um, moving on into applying for waiver services. Participation in any waiver, again, is going to require the establishment of Medi-Cal eligibility. The review process for Medi-Cal eligibility and waiver eligibility can take place concurrently. So it's, it's definitely worth checking out the appropriate state agency website for eligibility criteria and the application process. And I will include um, all those links in the notes for the slides. The slides for some waiver services, the first step to uh, accessing benefits is as simple as contacting your local county social services office. For others, however, an assessment must be coordinated through the program administrator to determine eligibility. And Assessments are a part of the application process for the waivers, and they're, they're, these are usually functional assessments to determine eligibility for services, as well as the type and amount of services that a person needs. And I wanna highlight that in California, HCBA, HCBS, uh, HCBS wave, waiver agencies are currently allowed to conduct initial level of care assessments, reassessments, and case management visits remotely, which is really meant to help minimize the risks uh, for people in acquiring COVID-19. Um, several agencies, we've heard that several agencies have continued with in-person assessments during the pandemic unless the recipient requests otherwise. So if you're working with a client who is at, at this stage of the process, at the assessment stage, to minimize COVID risks, it's definitely worth advocating for remote assessments. And I'll include some information on um, the Appendix K amendment that uh, basically allowed this this the remote assessments um, during this time and so the next slide is additional COVID-19 considerations so we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has greater implications for people who utilize LCSS and HCBS compared to the general population and certainly people receiving LTSS or uh, LTSS in nursing facilities are at an increased risk from coronavirus. This is, this is in the news quite often these days. Um, and of course, those in other congregate settings are also at risk, um, such as uh, assisted living facilities based on um, the risk of infection due to occupancy density. Um, but the other thing is that people in home and community-based settings also may be at great risk of adverse health outcomes and unmet daily self-care needs. So HCBS may be restricted as caregivers take precautions to limit coronavirus exposure to the individuals uh, they serve and also to themselves. If HCBS caregivers get ill and are unable to provide care, there can definitely be a severe shortage of HCBS available for those who need it. COVID-19 screening of direct care workers who are capable of transmi transmitting the disease to others while asymptomatic is also highly important to containing the spread of the, the virus. And this is especially true given that many people who receive HCBS have chronic conditions and compromised immune system, placing them at a high risk for, for severe outcomes if exposed to COVID-19. 
And then the last point on the slide is that the availability of medical supplies um, that are currently in short supply. So those receiving and providing HCBS are at risk from interruptions in access to medical supplies, which can interfere with the ability to manage daily health needs as well as prevent coronavirus infections. Um, and then the next slide, COVID-19 and IHSS emergency backup providers. So this is directly related to the previous slide in terms of trying to make sure that people receiving HCBS have continuity in the, in the provision of their personal care if their care is interrupted due to COVID-19. And this slide is talking specifically about the IHSS program, which again, is the most widely utilized HCBS program in California. And remember, this is a state plan benefit, so um, it's not part of a waiver program, and uh, which, which means it's an entitlement. And, and from the slide, I wanted to highlight that CDSS, or the California Department of Social Services, has instructed counties to create an emergency backup IHSS provider program which is outlined in the All County Letter 2029, which I'll also include a link to, uh, IHSS recipients can be assigned an emergency backup IHSS provider when their regular provider can no longer work because of COVID-19 impacts. And then how to find out more information about this, I've included a link on the slide um, by contacting the local public authority um, the social worker or the county IHSS offices for more information. Um, I wanted to briefly note here too that Justice in Aging and Disability Rights California conducted a really helpful training uh, this summer on this and other COVID related updates in the IHSS program. And I will include a link here and I will also include a link at the end under the resources uh, slide. And then moving along to IHSS provider personal protective equipment. So again, this slide is also related to the IHSS program and is meant to inform advocates that personal protective equipment should be available to IHSS providers who care for individuals with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Um, to contact the public authority offices in your county for distribution and that PPE, uh, PPE set consists of uh, a face mask and a pair of gloves. Um, I, I think this is something that um, as a provider or an advocate that I, I would ask the public authority for these supplies and I, because it's, you could at any time be, be exposed to COVID-19. So I would just make that argument, even though it says for individuals with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. And then um, the next slide is California Community Transitions or MFP. So the California Community Transitions Program is California's version of the Federal Money Follows the Person Program. This is another HCBS program, but it's not a waiver program. However, it is meant to assist individuals who need help to get out of a medical facility. So it's really important. And the CCT is available for, again, medical, medical el eligible individuals who have resi resided in a hospital or nursing facility for at least 90 days can help with finding a place to live and making sure that home care and furniture and utilities are ready. And it's important to know that it's not available in all counties. Um, eligible individuals uh, of all ages and disabilities have an opportunity to participate in this program. The Department of Healthcare Services works with designated CCT lead organizations who uh, employ transition coordinators who work directly with willing and eligible individuals uh, to monitor 
beneficiaries transitions from facilities to community settings of their choice. And then this slide is really just a list of important agencies. Um, many of you are going to know these, but I just thought it was important to, to put this here. Um, the, the California Department of Healthcare Services, so uh, DHCS administers the Medi-Cal program and is the lead agency on some of the HCBS waivers that we discussed. Uh, the California Department of Social Services, CDSS, is the agency responsible for the state level administration of the IHSS program. Uh, the county welfare departments in each of the 58 counties handle the day-to-day -day administration of IHSS. And then the public authority, I mentioned this previously, but they're a separate entity that uh, established by a county to manage enrollment of IHSS providers, provide trainings, and maintain a registry of available providers and they also act as the employer of record for collective bargaining purposes. Uh, the California Department of Developmental Services, or CDDS, um, they're, the, they're the agency through which the state of California provides services and supports to individuals with developmental disabilities. Uh, CDDS contracts with 21 regional centers to serve as a local resource to help find and access the services and supports available to individuals with developmental disabilities. And then lastly on this slide, the California Department of Aging or CDA, they administer programs that serve older adults, adults with disabilities, family caregivers and residents in long-term care facilities throughout the state. And they also administer a number of home and community-based programs, including the multi-purpose senior services program that we went over on one of the previous slides. And then lastly, um, this is the resources page. Quickly just going through this, um, paying for senior care is a is a, I found to be a pretty useful uh, resource in terms of breaking out some of the HCBS programs into a little more plain language and talking about um, the a little more extensively about some of the eligibility and application requirements. Um, of course, many of you are familiar with Justice and Aging's Advocates Guide. Um, which is uh, focuses on in-home supportive services and, and is a really valuable resource. Um, and then, of course, I wanted to put a link to uh, the the local county welfare offices in your county, um, and then uh, the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. Uh, or the PACE program, which is another HCBS program, not a waiver program, but can also be valuable for older adults who want to uh, live in the community. And we have made it to the end. Um, I want to obviously thank you all for uh, participating, sitting, basically sitting through this with me. Um, and I want to open it up for questions, and I'm going to um, hand it over to my colleague Sylvia Yi to um, to start reviewing some of the questions if we have them. Yes, we do. We have lots of good questions, and I'm hoping we'll have a chance to to go through most of them because we have a nice chunk of time for questions. Thank you, Sydney, for a great presentation um, and for getting us to a point where we actually have some time for questions. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try to go right to the very beginning and go through them. Um, let's see, the very first one was, um, oh, just a quick question about, about the, uh, the slide, the first page of the slides has a reference to LTSS, Long-Term Services and Supports. Um, and then I think it, the, the materials that were sent out talked about HCBS, Home and Community-Based Services. You are at the right webinar. <laughs> it's just that we focused on home and community-based services, that component of long-term services and supports. 
Um, let's see, going through again. Uh, we had one question um, simply about does home, does HCBS, home and community based services, does it also include IHSS? And the answer is yes. Um, I think Sydney, uh, that question was asked before Sydney reached that particular slide. Um, uh, we had a question about, I thought IHSS maximum hours were 283 hours a month, um, not 24 hours a day. Um, and yes, I, I believe that's correct. The, there, there's a category of, uh, for people with severe disabilities on, on Medi-Cal, and when you are an IHSS, the maximum is 283 hours a month. Um, if you don't, if you apparently don't have like, you're categorized as not severe disabilities, your maximum is 195 hours a month. But if you get a waiver, an individual on a waiver can get more hours a month than those limits. And Sydney, please feel free to, to jump in at any time as well if you, if you have additional insights. Uh, we had a question about how does someone apply to a waiver? And I, I do think uh, Sydney went through that uh, in more detail in a lot of the slides. So if, if you still have that question, uh, please uh, write again in the chat box and we'll hopefully get to you uh, if there's a particular one you were wondering about perhaps. Um, we also had a one person who uh, wrote a question, uh, who raised her hand and I think it's someone who maybe has difficulty with um, typing in the chat. So I'm wondering if we could uh, unmute Willa Tong. Is, is that possible to do so, she, um, so they can ask their question? Can we do that, Sydney? Will is yeah. unmuted. Okay. Willa, is there a question that you would like to, to ask us? Uh, not for now. I think I should uh, unmute myself. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will go back to the chat then. Um, let's see. Oh, unfortunately, I went slid back down. <laughs> um, okay. A question. Um, is the parent of a dependent disabled adult eligible to be a care provider under IHSS? Um, and I, I, I believe the answer is, is yes, you do have to meet the criteria, uh, which, in, it's, which includes some things like background checks or, and so forth. But in California, uh, a family member can qualify to be an IHSS, a paid IHSS provider. Um, and in fact, I believe a majority of IHS providers in California are family members. We had a question about how long on average are the wait lists for the assisted living waiver. Um, Sydney, do you have a sense of right now what the current wait time is? I'm not entirely sure of that. You know, I would have to double check that, but I believe that for the ALW, for the assisted living waiver, I believe it, it might be three to six months. Um, but I, I, would, I would have to double check that, certainly. Okay. And then there, I think there's an additional point. I think it's a separate thing to actually be applying to live in an assisted living facility some assisted living facilities have their own wait list to live in a particular place. And I think that that's a separate thing than applying for the assisted living waiver. So that's just something else to keep in mind. Um, I, in the chat box, I, I put in a link to um, uh, DH, the Department of Healthcare Services has, um, uh, they call them dashboards, and they're, they're basically like on, it's online information about different aspects of Medi-Cal services. So I, 
put a link in there that looks at what not the wait time for the assisted living waiver but the number of people waiting in any particular month um, the time period of the dashboard is from january 2019 to march 2020 um, and it just lists like in a given month how many people were on the assisted living facility wait list okay just making sure i don't miss anything of the questions There's a question, Sydney, about um, what is the waiver that helps homeless in shelters or temporary housing keep or receive IHSS? This, so this is Sydney. Um, so what I was speaking about um, in during the presentation was um, utilizing IHSS to um, assist folks in shelters, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a person experiencing homelessness um, couldn't also apply for a waiver. Um, it would just be a matter of figuring out um, based on the eligibility criteria of the waiver and the person's age um, and the person's um, healthcare needs um, which waiver they would be eligible for. Okay, let me keep on going through. Mm. That one we've answered. Um, there's a question here. Are there any other waivers or income exceptions for people who may not meet income requirements for Medi-Cal? but due to expenses need this type of assistance. And that, that is a, that's a, that's a difficult one. I mean, Medi-Cal is the, the primary provider of um, long-term services and supports and for home and community-based services. And it, it comes with these requirements, including income requirements. Um, there are, there are some specific uh, waivers that exist, let's say, for children that go above where the where the family income can go above the Medi-Cal um, income limits, uh, and we haven't covered all the waivers here. But in general, there are income requirements placed on there, and I think I think the the question was specific. Um, I mean, they the the person provided as an example, someone with end stage renal disease who is having financial difficulties paying for living expenses as well as medical expenses. And we know that this is definitely an issue for a lot of folks and people with ESRD are, they're on Medicare, but they're not covered by, they can't get Medicare gap insurance and they're limited in the assistance that they, that they can get. Um, it, I mean, this is an issue for a lot of individuals who fall in that in between, right? Not poor enough for Medi-Cal um, and not at the stage of income where you can just pay for all the medical expenses. Uh, I, it's, it's, really, it's just really difficult. Um, and that's why a lot of individuals can be caught in that trap of having to spend down to Medi-Cal levels, um, which is not productive for them and not productive for you know, the economy either. And these are, these are people who, who can be working, want to be working, are able to have savings, uh, but then that means they don't qualify for Medi-Cal. Um, it's not an answer. I, I mean, there are a few waivers and things, up, potentially some waivers and other types of assistance, but in general, there isn't a lot. And it, that's why we feel strongly that long-term care, home and community-based services needs to be something that the entire country addresses more holistically rather than as something that's just provided to people who are very, very low income uh, or who are unable to make an income. I'm going to go on to the next question. We had a, a question um, that was on the Q&A box about do you have to be a US citizen to receive these services. Um, in, 
in general, states do have some discretion to expand Medicaid. Medicaid is what it's known as federally. Um, in California, it's Medi-Cal. And if a state is willing to take on the expense of expanding because federal funds are limited to citizens, um, a state can expand it. And California has actually taken some of those steps. Uh, most recently, as of January 1st, 2020, California expanded its full scope medical services to all young adults up to age 26, regardless of immigration status. Prior to that, uh, Medi-Cal had been expanded in California to all children, regardless of immigration status. <clears throat> so slowly, California has been working to try to close the gap of, of individuals who are uninsured in California. Um, at the moment, it's still not completely open, though. There are, there are restrictions. If you're someone uh, in your 40s who doesn't have uh, an immigration status, an official immigration status, I don't know if you can get on Medi-Cal. In fact, I suspect you cannot. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, we had a question about the, the, the MFP, whether it has been refunded. And that's another question, similar, a similar question about the, the CCT program, the Community Transitions Program. Um, that is in a state of kind of constant flux. I know there have been a lot of attempts, a lot of advocates uh, federally and in states have been trying to get for instance, MFP refunded through the um, some of the COVID legislation. Since it's it, there is a link, it's so critical for people to be able to get uh, services in the community, uh, especially during the time when institutional care has been so fraught with um, COVID nineteen vulnerability. I um, I at this point I'm not completely up on all the attempts and would actually have to research that a little bit, um, which makes me think that that would be a good topic for us to do some research and for DREDF to send out some current information on that. I, I have to say it, it, it fluctuates <laughs> quite a bit. Um, so it's hard to stay right on top of it. I, I, we're constantly trying to keep those funding streams up um, and constantly trying to get permanent funding, let's say, for MFP. And it, it's, it's been a, a, a political fight. I think some of it, honestly, will, will also depend upon what happens with the, the coming election and transition. So get out there and vote, everyone. <laughs> um, from my experience, it is very often, this is another question. From my experience, it is often very difficult for people needing an IHSS provider to find a reliable IHSS provider. Does your agency work to change this situation? Uh, DREDF is not a, a service provider, so we aren't directly working on the issue of um, IHS uh, providers or backup of IHS providers, but it is uh, an issue we, we look at. Um, in general, we're a, a legal and policy organization we try to work more in, on the broader systemic issues, but there are um, there are agencies who may be able to help more with this particular situation. Sydney, did you have anything to add? Okay. Okay. Just working through more. Um, Uh, I put this in the chat, but for anyone who has trouble reading the chat, uh, Christina, Christina Mills, who is the um, head of the California Foundation of Independent Living Centers, wanted to note that the State Independent Living Council and the Department of Rehabilitation have a statewide transition fund available for all independent living centers to use for transition and diversion uh, of people from um, institutional uh, long-term care. We had a question, um, does the CCT program provide services to those that are at risk of being placed in a facility? 
in other words, to help them avoid an unwanted placement. Um, this is a question, Jack, I will research that to be sure, because I don't have the answer off the top of my head and I'd like to be sure before giving an answer. <laughs> um, we had a question here, uh, a comment about, uh, to thank us for mentioning the PACE program. Uh, and this is uh, Kerry Holko, who would love to connect with, with, uh, with anyone to chat about future opportunities uh, on PACE. And thank you, well, let's send an email to us, <laughs> we'll talk after. Um, are there any funds for those who do not qualify for Medi-Cal, but are not wealthy enough for private pay? Well, uh, yes, I think I talked about this earlier. It, that's a really difficult area. That's in, an area that um, advocates are working on um, uh, politically and practically. And I, I, there has been, there are different coalitions, a couple of them at least. Um, Dredef is part of the, the California Aging and Disability, um, CADA, uh, or CATA, that works on this issue, trying to institute a, like a, a universal long-term care benefit in California for people who are aging, for people with disabilities, uh, because we recognize the problem is universal. Um, disability is a natural part of living and aging um, and needing long-term care at some point in one's life. Needing long-term care services is also a natural part of aging and we, we want to think that through and how that need can be met um, without having to be either very, very low income or very, very wealthy. We have an individual, Regina Brink, who had her hand raised. And if we can unmute her, uh, perhaps she can ask the question. Um, is that, let me see if I can do that actually. Regina. Regina, okay. Regina, you can unmute yourself. I think I did do that. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a question about plans to integrate more comprehensive services for people with vision loss. The highest group of people who are going blind are over 55 and fall into low income brackets. And they're people of color as well but there's been very little effort to incorporate them into long-term living plans. And I'd like to know if, if there's any thought about changing that. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. I, and I'm, I'm sorry if it's Regina or Regina, and I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't mean to be- uh, uh, Regina, Regina, Regina. Sorry. Okay, thank you, Regina. Um, that's an excellent point and something to for those long-term care coalitions I, I was mentioning to be to be thinking about as well um, yeah integrated it's it's interesting um, California had been recently thinking about a new integrated um, health care at home service that was kind of exciting to be thinking about but um, I think just very recently in the last one or two days that the plans for that are not moving forward. Um, word of that just came out. I got it yesterday. So that's, <laughs> that's unfortunate. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it, there's been just work on trying to get a long-term, you know, a more, a more general long-term care benefit really being considered and, and worked on. Um, and having a broad coalition would be important on this. So thank you for raising the point, Regina. Um, it's something certainly that, I mean, needs are always very specific when it comes down to it. Um, and, and the more people with disabilities who are, are working on this and people with disabilities of color, the better. Um, Yes, and sometimes people with sensory disabilities are forgotten when plans are made. Um, historically, it's part mm -hmm. of the issue. And that's, okay. you know, there's, I can talk to someone more specifically about what the needs are, but appliances, for instance, marking your appliances to be independent. There's right. for that, those kinds of things. Yes, right. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate the point. Um, 
I'm going to go on to a couple of questions that were in the Q&A box. Um, one question is, Sydney, I think you referred to a list of subsidized housing, and there was a question of where we can find that list. Yeah, and so it, I will include that information when we send out the PowerPoint under the link for the assisted living waiver. Um, but if you go to the assisted living waiver website um, for this for the agency that um, oversees the waiver on that website, there will there is where I found the um, list of public subsidized housing units and the list was quite short um, and so um, uh, the other option too is if you um, send me your email in the chat I can forward you that link uh, uh, as soon as possible um, we have a the next question is about whether we have any suggestions for dealing with shelters that are having trouble accommodating specific disabilities or caregivers due to intake space slash available bedding. Sydney, is that? Something? Yeah, yeah, I think um, if uh, Ruth, if you uh, if you'd like to contact me um, offline, we can definitely talk more about this. Um, DreadF has definitely um, done some advocacy around uh, shelter accommodations, um, particularly for older adults with disabilities. Um, and so I, I would definitely um, love like to talk to you more about this. And we have a. We have another question um, um, from Rebecca about how our organization is different from Disability Rights California. So uh, DRC, Disability Rights California, is a sister organization. We work closely with them actually um, on, on different, lots of different issues uh, and have brought litigation. I, I have a case with DRC right now, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Um, so our, our interests align. We work for the same group of people. Um, one of the differences is that DRC is, uh, in, uh, um, is an officially designated agency. It receives federal funds um, and some state funds too, I think, um, for specifically for serving people with disabilities. Um, DREDF actually started even before then. Um, we're celebrating our 45th anniversary this year uh, and we are we don't receive federal funds except when we um, uh, specifically apply for them under a particular grant uh, and and our work is not specific is not we work nationally uh, a little more broadly in our lens um, systemically uh, in, in the the work that we do um, disability rights California also takes in direct uh, intake calls and and serves individual clients in a way that um, DREDF is more limited in, in, in doing because of our size and our capacity. Um, and that's just a couple of the differences. Um, but the key, the key thing to remember is that we, we do serve a lot of the same people and we work together a lot of the time as well. Um, I'm just also in chat putting down, thinking of people who serve, um, a message from from Jack Daly, uh, uh, who's telling about that, um, telling you all about the Health Consumer Alliance, uh, which is uh, an alliance of um, of frontline legal service attorneys who work a lot in the area of healthcare and work a lot in medical eligibility, uh, and uh, and the National Health Law Program, which is also here in California. Um, and that's a great resource for people, uh, people with disabilities and medical medical beneficiaries or applicants who are looking for med uh, legal advice and representation. Oh, and there was another comment: you can get on emergency medical if you are undocumented, but I'm not sure if that impacts public charge rule. Yes, that's a that's a good a good thing to bring up. Um, the, 
counties do cover uh, like emergency medical needs. If you wind up in, a, in an emergency room because you've been hit by a bus and you're not, a, you're, you don't have um, official immigrant status, Medi-Cal, I believe, will cover that and will cover those uh, emergency services. Um, that kind of emergency is, I think, not counted in the public charge rule. But um, our current federal administration has put through, um, uh, proposed a public charge rule that became official. It was fought very hard and then became official a few months ago and is now, I think, stayed, but only in a few specific states in the country. Um, as I said, this is a rule that's really being hard fought. The rule counts Medi-Cal um, immigrant, immigrant use of Medi-Cal services as something that may be counted against an individual when they apply for green card uh, eligibility. Um, and that is a whole other additional, <laughs> very large bag uh, of um, law and policy to unpack. And I don't think we can address that here, but it is something that has had a remarkable chilling effect. Very unfortunate um, for people who are seeking uh, health care for which they are eligible in California. And it is especially unfortunate during a time of pandemic when we want everyone who might have the virus or think they have a virus to get testing and care. So just to raise that point. Um, I'm trying to think of, I think we have covered most of the questions that have been sent. And I'm just trying to make sure because I don't want to leave anything out. Um, yeah. And if there's anything that any anyone else wants to raise at the end here, I'm happy to. To, we. I mean, this is this has been remarkable, Sydney. You've actually done a, a website where there is real time for questions. That is fantastic, <laughs> and and rare. So if anyone would uh, like to ask another question, uh, please do feel free to do so. I'm just adding another information source on the chat. Uh, oh, there was one thing I wanted to mention, which I found out fairly recently, and that is that the IHSS public authorities have said that they will also provide personal protective equipment, PPE, for IHSS consumers. So for the consumers who need a pair of gloves and a mask, you can also contact your public health authority and ask for it. I don't have details about how you will actually get them, whether you have to, whether they expect someone to show up and get them or, um, but I just thought, I just wanted to share that, that they are supposed to be available. And I think that's a interesting point to know. Um, oh, uh, a new question. Um, hmm. uh, I'll, since your focus is on housing, Sydney, can you update on state of affordable housing, especially for older adults? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that, uh, particularly with the um, the the federal money that is available under that has been available under the CARES Act, um, can be used particularly. Um, The work that I do particularly in um, in the area of housing 
for people with disabilities um, focuses on increasing access to affordable and accessible housing. Um, and so DREDF uh, is involved in um, work with um, the, in terms of um, advancing the accessibility regulations, um, both state and federal, um, in terms of um, what access features are, are provided uh, for people with uh, disabilities in, in uh, state and federal, federally subsidized housing. Um, and I mean, I think, you know, particularly in terms of what's happening with the pandemic, um, I, it's my understanding that the state will, uh, particularly in terms of the evictions, that the eviction um, moratorium um, being lifted, uh, that the state is going to have to really come up with uh, some solutions in terms of increasing access to affordable housing. Um, and particularly for me, something that I, I've been interested in a long time is um, um, legislation that would promote a housing for all um, and, and not just in the terms of, of shelter for all, but, but actual um, housing. And so um, I, obviously we're not there yet, um, but uh, this is something that, that DREDF um, will continue to work on. Um, uh, just some more information that has been shared in our in the chat. Um, Rebecca has let us know that the wait list for elderly only uh, with subsidi subsidized housing in Sacramento is one to two years. And Christina Mills with CFILC has let us know that the because the, there was a question about um, the uh, the ILC funds, independent living funds. Uh, so the state plan for independent living developed a transition fund for ILCs to use when consumers are looking to transition from institutionalization to community living. I have an interesting question here uh, uh, from Sal, Sal asking whether all homeless shelters or hotels, are they supposed to allow IHSS services? That's a that's a really good question. I think it's something um, that um, advocates definitely struggle with. Um, I um, because the IHSS has a uh, program requirement, an own home requirement um, that a person with disabilities who receives services um, should needs to be able to receive them in their home. Um, but it's my understanding that the state has issued guidance that says that shelters, that, that um, people experiencing homelessness with disabilities uh, can't, that shelters can qualify as meeting the own home requirement. And I've, I've talked to people and I've talked to shelter providers that, that indeed, uh, you know, actually assist people who are staying in the shelters to receive IHSS services services, um, but as I also indicated in the slides, um, we've definitely also seen that, um, you know, particularly with the Project Room Key program that some of the hotel providers are not, um, are not complying with this. Um, and so this, this is definitely um, ongoing advocacy um, for uh, disability rights advocates and aging advocates. Um, and um, I mean, I, I think it's really a goal um, for us to help come up with a policy um, for these programs and particularly because Project Room Key, Room Key will be turning into, um, is supposed to be turning into a more permanent housing program called Project Home Key, um, <laughs> where um, these hotels and motels are meant to be converted into longer term uh, housing opportunities. And you know, people are going to need IHSS in these settings as well. And so 
um, I think your, your question is very poignant um, and um, it's something that, that we're also continuing to work on. Right. Um, you know, I, I think it, it is something, this is something we, uh, many advocate groups are wanting to hear about, including DREDF. So if there, there are active stories you're hearing about um, or that you're experiencing, uh, that, you, th that you're having these denials happen, we would like to hear about it because the more we know about what's happening on the ground, um, the more we can try to fashion some kind of uh, solution for it. Um, I'm not sure if it'd be possible to appeal that through Medi-Cal. I mean, of course, you, you can try, but it, uh, the, it's, the, the shelters themselves are not necessarily or inherently Medi-Cal entities. So I'm not sure that you would be able to appeal their denial of entrance through Medi-Cal. Um, so we're looking at other kinds of laws uh, that might apply. Um, just a note that the CCT program only covers some states, some states that have actually applied for it. Um, but the, the state uh, plan for independent living is accessible for individuals across California who are, are looking to, for that kind of transition assistance. Uh, I've been asked to state again the info about PPE supplies for IHS recipients. So this is something I heard from um, at an advocate meeting uh, from, the, um, C from the California Department of Social Services saying that consumers are supposed to be able to have access to, to PPE, PPE, a, a mask and a pair of gloves from the public authority. So getting in touch with your county public authority, your, your county IHSS public authority um, would, I, that's, that should be the way to, to, to get a, a set of PPE. Um, let's see, I have one question from the, oh, okay. And it was, some people I know are signing off and hoping they'll still get the attachments. I'm not sure what that means, but I, as, so just repeating again that we will be sending out, um, the recording of the webinar and the PowerPoints to everyone who registered for this webinar. And the webinar itself will also be recorded and placed on our website. I don't think it'll happen in the next hour, but it will happen <laughs> in a reasonable state of time. Um, and also uh, another message from Christina that some independent living centers and state councils on developmental disabilities also have PPE available to consumers. And that's a good thing to know. Thank you, Christina. Um, I think we are coming close to our one o'clock ending time. Uh, it was great to be able to have so many, um, so many questions and to be able to get to so many of them. Thank you everyone for your attention and your participation and your sharing of information. Um, Sydney, are there any last words you would like to, to share? Um, I just want to thank everyone again for their time um, and for the opportunity. If you have additional questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my, again, my email is S as in Sally Pickern, P as in Paul, I-C-K-E-R-N, as in Nancy at dreadf.org. Uh, and um, please be on the lookout for additional trainings coming from DREDF, um, we will be providing um, some more uh, housing focused trainings, uh, particularly for people with disabilities experiencing homelessness. And we would like you all to join, join us again. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you. Great. And, and as, a, as a final and very appropriate note, great thanks to our interpreters and our captioner who always does you guys always do such a wonderful job. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your afternoon.
Okay, well, thank you so much for having us. And if there's anything else, if there's not anything else, then me and Chris will sign off. Thank yeah. you guys. Thank you. You did a great job. No problem. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for your flexibility. Have a great day. You too. <laughs> you too. Bye. Bye. Okay, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and end the call. Oh, look, you can see my hands. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. <laughs>